We have already shown that wet and dry must both give rise to an evaporation. Earthquakes are a necessary consequence of this fact. The earth is essentially dry, but rain fills it with moisture. Then the sun and its own fire warm it and give rise to a quantity of wind both outside and inside it. This wind sometimes flows outwards in a single body, sometimes inwards, and sometimes it is divided. All these are necessary laws. Next, we must find out what body has the greatest motive force. This will certainly be the body that naturally moves farthest and is most violent. Now that which has the most rapid motion is necessarily the most violent, for its swiftness gives its impact the greatest force. Again, the rarest body, that which can most readily pass through every other body, is that which naturally moves farthest. Wind satisfies these conditions in the highest degree. Fire only becomes flame and moves rapidly when wind accompanies it. So that not water nor earth is the cause of earthquakes, but wind, that is, the inrush of the external evaporation into the earth. Hence, since the evaporation generally follows in a continuous body in the direction in which it first started, and either all of it flows inwards or all outwards, most earthquakes and the greatest are accompanied by calm. It is true that some take place when the wind is blowing, but this presents no difficulty. We sometimes find several winds blowing simultaneously. If one of these enters the earth, we get an earthquake attended by wind. Only these earthquakes are less severe because their source and cause is divided. Again, most earthquakes in the severest occur at night, or, if by day, about noon, that being generally the calmest part of the day. For when the sun exerts its full power, as it does about noon, it shuts the evaporation into the earth. Night, too, is calmer than day. The absence of the sun makes the evaporation return into the earth like a sort of ebb tide, corresponding to the outward flow, especially towards dawn, for the wind, as a rule, begin to blow then, and if their source changes about, like the Euripus, and flows inwards, the quantity of wind in the earth is greater, and a more violent earthquake results. The severest earthquakes take place where the sea is full of currents or the earth spongy and cavernous. So they occur near the Hellespont and in Achaia and Sicily, and those parts of Euboea which correspond to our description, where the sea is supposed to flow in channels below the earth. The hot springs, too, near Oedipus are due to a cause of this kind. It is the confined character of these places that makes them so liable to earthquakes. A great and therefore violent wind is developed, which would naturally blow away from the earth. But the onrush of the sea in a great mass thrusts it back into the earth. The countries that are spongy below the surface are exposed to earthquakes because they have room for so much wind. For the same reason, earthquakes usually take place in spring and autumn and in times of wet and of drought, because these are the windiest seasons. Summer, with its heat, and winter, with its frost, calls calm. Winter is too cold, summer too dry for winds to form. In time of drought the air is full of wind. Drought is just a predominance of the dry over the moist evaporation. Again, excessive rain causes more of the evaporation to form in the earth. Then this secretion is shut up in a narrow compass and forced into a smaller space by the water that fills the cavities. Thus, a great wind is compressed into a smaller space and so gets the upper hand, and then breaks out and beats against the earth and shakes it violently. We must suppose the action of the wind in the earth to be analogous to the tremors and throbbings caused in us by the force of the wind contained in our bodies. Thus, some earthquakes are a sort of tremor, others a sort of throbbing. Again, we must think of an earthquake as something like the tremor that often runs through the body after passing water as the wind returns inwards from without in one volume. The force wind can have may be gathered not only from what happens in the air, where one might suppose that it owed its power to produce such effects to its volume, but also from what is observed in animal bodies. Tetanus and spasms are motions of wind, and their force is such that the united efforts of many men do not succeed in overcoming the movements of the patients. We must suppose, then, to compare great things with small, that what happens in the earth is just like that. Our theory has been verified by actual observation in many places. 
It has been known to happen that an earthquake has continued until the wind that caused it burst through the earth into the air and appeared visibly like a hurricane. This happened lately near Heraclea in Pontus, and sometime passed at the island Hyera, one of the group called the Aeolian Islands. Here a portion of the earth swelled up, and a lump like a mound rose with a noise. Finally it burst, and a great wind came out of it and threw up live cinders and ashes, which buried the neighboring town of Lepara and reached some of the towns in Italy. The spot where this eruption occurred is still to be seen. Indeed, this must be recognized as the cause of the fire that is generated in the earth. The air is first broken up in small particles, and then the wind is beaten about, and so catches fire. A phenomenon in these islands affords further evidence of the fact that winds move below the surface of the earth. When a south wind is going to blow, there is a premonitory indication. A sound is heard in the places from which the eruptions issue. This is because the sea is being pushed on from a distance, and its advance thrusts back into the earth the wind that was issuing from it. The reason why there is a noise and no earthquake is that the underground spaces are so extensive in proportion to the quantity of the air that is being driven on that the wind slips away into the void beyond. Again, our theory is supported by the facts that the sun appears hazy and is darkened in the absence of clouds, and that there is sometimes calm and sharp frost before earthquakes at sunrise. The sun is necessarily obscured and darkened when the evaporation which dissolves and rarefies the air begins to withdraw into the earth. The calm, too, and the cold toward sunrise and dawn follow from the theory. The calm we have already explained. There must, as a rule, be calm, because the wind flows back into the earth. Again, it must be most marked before the more violent earthquakes, for when the wind is not part outside earth, part inside, but moves in a single body, its strength must be greater. The cold comes because the evaporation, which is naturally and essentially hot, enters the earth. Wind is not recognized to be hot because it sets the air in motion, and that is full of a quantity of cold vapor. It is the same with the breath we blow from our mouth. Close by it is warm, as it is when we breathe out through the mouth, but there is so little of it that it is scarcely noticed, whereas at a distance it is cold for the same reason as wind. Well, when this evaporation disappears into the earth, the vaporous exhalation concentrates and causes cold in any place in which this disappearance occurs. A sign which sometimes precedes earthquakes can be explained in the same way. Either by day or a little after sunset, in fine weather, a little, light, long-drawn cloud is seen, like a long, very straight line. This is because the wind is leaving the air and dying down. Something analogous to this happens in the seashore. When the sea breaks in great waves, the marks left on the sand are very thick and crooked. But when the sea is calm, they are slight and straight, because the secretion is small. As the sea is to the shore, so the wind is to the cloudy air. So, when the wind drops, this very straight and thin cloud is left, a sort of wave mark in the air. An earthquake sometimes coincides with an eclipse of the moon for the same reason. When the earth is on the point of being interposed, but the light and the heat of the sun is not quite vanished from the air, but is dying away, the wind which causes the earthquake before the eclipse turns off into the earth and calm ensues. For there often are winds before eclipses. At nightfall if the eclipse is at midnight, and at midnight if the eclipse is at dawn. They are caused by the lessening of the warmth from the moon when its sphere approaches the point at which the eclipse is going to take place. So the influence which restrained and quieted the air weakens, and the air moves again and the wind rises, and does so later, the later the eclipse. A severe earthquake does not stop at once or after a single shock, but first the shocks go on, often for about 40 days. After that, for one or even two years, it gives premonitory indications in the same place. The severity of the earthquake is determined by the quantity of wind and the shape of the passages through which it flows. Where it is beaten back and cannot easily find its way out, the shocks are most violent, and there it must remain in a cramped space like water that cannot escape. Any throbbing in the body does not cease suddenly or quickly, but by degrees according as the affection passes off. So here the agency which created the evaporation and gave it an impulse to motion 
clearly does not at once exhaust the whole of the material from which it forms, the wind, which we call an earthquake. So, until the rest of this is exhausted, the shocks must continue, though more gently, and they must go on until there is too little of the evaporation left to have any perceptible effect on the earth at all. Subterranean noises, too, are due to the wind. Sometimes they portend earthquakes, but sometimes they have been heard without any earthquake following. Just as the air gives off various sounds when it is struck, so it does when it strikes other things. For striking involves being struck, and so the two cases are the same. The sound precedes the shock because sound is thinner and passes through things more readily than wind. But when the wind is too weak by reason of thinness to cause an earthquake, the absence of a shock is due to its filtering through readily, though by striking hard and hollow masses of different shapes, it makes various noises, so that the earth sometimes seems to bellow, as the portent mongers say. Water has been known to burst out during an earthquake, but that does not make water the cause of the earthquake. The wind is the efficient cause, whether it drives the water along the surface or up from below, just as winds are the causes of waves and not waves of winds. Else, we might as well say that the earth was the cause, for it is upset in an earthquake, just like water, for effusion is a form of upsetting. No, earth and water are material causes, being patients, not agents. The true cause is the wind. The combination of a tidal wave with an earthquake is due to the presence of contrary winds. It occurs when the wind, which is shaking the earth, does not entirely succeed in driving off the sea, which another wind is bringing on but pushes it back and heaps it up in a great mass in one place. Given the situation, it follows that when this wind gives way, the whole body of the sea, driven on by the other wind, will burst out and overwhelm the land. This is what happened in Achaia. There a south wind was blowing, but outside a north wind. Then there was a calm and the wind entered the earth, and then the tidal wave came on and simultaneously there was an earthquake. This was the more violent as the sea allowed no exit to the wind that had entered the earth, but shut it in. So in their struggle with one another, the wind caused the earthquake and the wave by its settling down the inundation. Earthquakes are local and often affect a small district only, whereas winds are not local. Such phenomena are local when the evaporations at a given place are joined by those from the next and unite. This, as we explained, is what happens when there is drought or excessive rain locally. Now, earthquakes do come about in this way, but winds do not. For earthquakes, rains, and droughts have their source and origin inside the earth, so that the sun is not equally able to direct all the evaporations in one direction. But on the evaporations in the air, the sun has more influence, so that when once they have been given an impulse by its motion, which is determined by its various positions, they flow in one direction. When the wind is present in sufficient quantity, there is an earthquake. The shocks are horizontal like a tremor, except occasionally in a few places where they act vertically upwards from below like a throbbing. It is the vertical direction which makes this kind of earthquake so rare. The motive force does not easily accumulate in great quantity in the position required, since the surface of the earth secretes far more of the evaporation than its depths. Wherever an earthquake of this kind does occur, a quantity of stones comes to the surface of the earth, as when you throw up things in a winnowing fan as we see from Sipolis and the Phagrian Plain and the district in Liguria, which were devastated by this kind of earthquake. Islands in the middle of the sea are less exposed to earthquakes than those near land. First, the volume of the sea cools the evaporations and overpowers them by its weight and so crushes them. Then, currents and not shocks are produced in the sea by the action of the winds. Again, it is so extensive that evaporations do not collect in it but issue from it, and these draw the evaporations from the earth after them. Islands near the continent really form part of it. The intervening sea is not enough to make any difference, but those in the open sea can only be shaken if the whole of the sea that surrounds them is shaken too. We have now explained earthquakes, their nature and cause, and the most important of the circumstances attendant on their appearance.